Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us and welcome to the City Club of Central Oregon. Today's program is titled, Is Central Oregon as Welcoming as We Think? My name is Blair Garland, Senior Director of Community Relations and Marketing at OSU Cascades, which is City Club's community partner and education annual sponsor. And I'm also honored this year to serve as your City Club Board President. I'd like to take a moment to thank our other annual sponsors because without their support, we would not be able to bring our community together for important conversations such as this one. Even in this challenging year, our annual sponsors have continued to step up and support City Club because they care deeply about our community. So please give a virtual round of applause to our platinum sponsors, St. Charles Health System and Brooks Resources, to our gold sponsors, ASI Wealth Management, Pacific Source, and First Interstate Bank, to our partner in higher education and workforce development, COCC, and to our silver sponsors, Ameriprise Financial, BBT Architects, Kittleson and Associates, Miller Lumber, Mosaic Medical, the Lucier Center, Transformation Systems International, and U.S. Bank. Today's live stream is also made possible by our partnership with Connect Central Oregon, a nonprofit launched with the assistance of the OSU Cascades Innovation Co-op. Now, as you know, City Club fosters civil conversations about the issues that matter the most to our community. But to do this, we do need your support. Your investment in City Club, whether that's a membership, a sponsorship, we're volunteering your time is about civil productive conversations and about helping our community really be the best that it can be. We've all watched our nation's challenges over the past year, and it's clear that a constructive dialogue is needed probably now more than ever. Please check out our website at cityclubco.org for more information about how you can become involved. Now let me introduce today's moderator. JC Knorr is a member of our program committee and has helped shape today's forum. JC recently sold his printing business to help several old friends manage the explosive growth at Zamp Solar in Bend. JC has called Central Oregon home for 20 years, relishing every opportunity to make his community more resilient, more self-introspective, and more connected. And with that in mind, he joined our program committee last year. Now, his friends, colleagues, and faith community helped him discern the tug of justice working through his life about a decade ago. In the time following, he's only become more convinced that co-laboring in the struggle for environmental, racial, social, and economic justice is our highest calling. JC, I pass the microphone to you. Uh, that the beautiful land now known as Bend, Oregon, stretching north to the Columbia River, is the original homeland of the Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs. Uh, the Confederated Tribes called this land in the Treaty of 1855 while retaining their regular and uh, customary hunting, fishing, and gathering rights. The Warm Springs, Wasco, and Northern Paiute people inhabited this area in certain seasonal times that clearly established their presence. It's also important to note that the Klamath Trail ran north through this region to the Great Celio Falls trading grounds. Uh, this trade route expanded the impact of commerce between tribal nations. We acknowledge and thank the original stewards of this land, and it's our hope that the guests continue to honor and care for this land. Um, hi everybody, I'm uh, JC Nori, I'm moderating this. Um, our systemic, systemic racism and social injustice still exist in this world. Even 155 years after the passage of the 13th Amendment abolishing slavery, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the passage of the City of Bend's 2004 Equal Rights Ordinance, and the resurgence of the Black Lives Matter movement in 2020. It can be hard to acknowledge that these issues may hit closer to home that we, than we think. Uh, today, we'll take a look at, the, at Central Oregon's history of racial exclusion, that, and we'll invite everyone into a discussion about how we can make a change uh, in the future. Joining us today for this conversation are Kip Jones, Executive Pastor at Antioch Church, Marcus Legrand, COCC's College and Career Success Coach, Jenna Goodman Campbell, a Ben City Counselor and Mayor Pro Tem, Kinsey Martin, the Director of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion for the Ben Lapine School District. We'll, they'll be providing a look into what initiatives we as a community are taking to ensure that Central Oregon grows to be more diverse, safe, and accessible to everyone. Um, we realize that this live stream will only skim the surface of racial injustice. Our goal today is to make sure you have a better understanding of the history of race relations in Central Oregon, the current initiatives in place, and what we can all do to make changes. As we kick off, I'd also like to invite you to participate in our Mentimeter poll. The question of the hour is how welcoming is Central Oregon to people 
of color. Um, you can participate by clicking the link on the screen. I believe that, that will be provided. Um, and as we work on that, first I'd like to welcome Kip Jones, uh, the executive pastor at Antioch Church. He first started hearing about racial injustices in Oregon while he completed his master's degree and was so moved by the research information that he wrote, uh, filmed, and directed a documentary called Premeditated Uniformity for his thesis project. It's available online at no charge and should be part of an email link that we'll be sending out later. Kip, thanks for being here. Uh, thank you, uh, City Club, for inviting me to this very important conversation today. Um, it is important to me because Bend is my home. I have three kids that are just about to enter into the educational system here, um, and I care deeply about stopping the racial injustices and long for a community that sees the value and worth in every individual. Pretty much all my knowledge and research that uh, I will be sharing with you has taken place within the last six years. So I'll be squeezing those six years into six minutes. Um, I'm still learning, I'm no expert. Um, and if you haven't already, like JC said, I have a documentary that covers uh, way more than what I'm sharing today. Um, so please, please check that out. Um, the first time I heard about these laws, these racial injustices in Oregon, I was shocked and at the same time very intrigued. So I dove into researching as much as I could. Uh, the first fact that I heard that got, um, that got me wanting to learn more was that Oregon had an anti-Black law when it became a state in the Union. So on February 14th, 1859, Oregon became the only state admitted to the Union with an exclusion law written to its state's constitution. And that law meant exactly what it sounds like. It meant if you were black, that it was against the law for you to be in Oregon. This was very disturbing to me because I have gone through Oregon's education system from grade school through college without ever being taught about any of Oregon's sordid past. Um, it wasn't until during my graduate degree that I started to hear about the racial injustices that Oregon was born out of. Um, and before I learned all these events, when people asked, why is Ben so white? I used to say, that's just the way it is. Um, but now I say there are many reasons that have contributed to Ben being so white. Uh, because of the exclusion law and many other laws that Oregon has passed, minority groups moved to other areas when heading west, but stayed clear of Oregon. Oregon's whiteness is exactly the way it was designed to be. Uh, the goal for my brief time sharing today is to give you a snapshot of facts that will hopefully compel you to dive in more and learn more for yourself. Uh, I don't have the time to properly address all the injustices that plagued the Native Americans or to dive into the way Chinese were treated and even massacred in Oregon. Um, those are covered in the documentary. I will be covering some of the main stories I found about Central Oregon and also the laws that Oregon has had. So here you go. Um, in 1862, Oregon adopted a law requiring all Negroes, Chinese, Hawaiians, and mulattoes residing in Oregon to pay an annual tax of $5. You are paying a tax because of the color of your skin. Um, if they could not pay this tax, they were forced into service maintaining state roads for 50 cents a day. This is another example of a law that pushed these minority groups to outside of Oregon. In 1920, in what would have been the beginning of a small community of Japanese immigrants here in Central Oregon, George Shima, the potato king of California, purchased over 13,000 acres of land in the Pal Butte area, intending to turn them into a large potato farm. The Japanese farm workers arrived in Oregon to a wave of uneasiness and anxiety among white farmers. Our local newspapers kept account. Uh, this quote is what a local farmer wrote about Shima's right-hand Japanese worker, Bert. As to Bert, we'll show him a juniper tree with a rope hung over a limb and see if he can take the hint. The Japanese ended up selling all their land after a year because of the hostilities towards them. Later in the early 1920s, at the height of the Ku Klux Klan, 15% of white male Americans were card carrying members, while Oregon had the highest per capita membership. The Bin Bulletin published article after article about the Klan's activities in Bin throughout the 20s, including a story about a chilling day when Klan, uh, the Klan practically brought the uh, town of Bin to a standstill. 
the Bin Bulletin wrote on September 8th, 1923, ceremonies of the Ku Klux Klan were held last night on Pilot Butte, following a parade of Klansmen in automobiles through the streets of Bend. The parade passed south of Wall Street, down Franklin to Congress, and east on Delaware. The parade halted for several minutes at the Klan's headquarters on Hill Street, then proceeded east on Greenwood Avenue and out the road to the Butte. At the bottom of the road, up the Butte, a sentry car, a sentry car had already been placed. One of those standing there was Justice of the Peace, E.D. Gilson, wearing a Klansman's robe. Shortly after the first of the cars reached the summit, the flaming cross, which had been seen on two previous occasions, appeared on the west side of the Butte. The cross was lighted a few minutes before nine o'clock and was still burning at 1030. So crosses were burned on top of Pilot Butte many times, and at least four of them were burned by the KKK. E.D. Gilson, the justice of the peace wearing the Klansman robe, later became the mayor of Bend. It was 69 years after being enacted, Oregon's black exclusion laws were removed from her constitution in 1926. In 1943, 61 years after legislation was passed in Congress, the Chinese exclusion acts were removed from law. 89 years after being enacted, Oregon's law forbidding interracial marriage was repealed in 1951. The 15th Amendment, which guaranteed Blacks the right to vote, was ratified by the state of Oregon in 1959, 89 years after it had been rejected. John A. Brown was one of the first Black settlers in Oregon. The Central Oregon Canyon, which is right between Madras and Warm Springs where he lived, uh, was, was referred to as or later Negro Canyon on maps and official documents for over a century. In 2013, it was officially renamed John Brown Canyon. There are still dozens of landmarks in Oregon with derogatory names. I have only touched on a few events and laws that have shaped the way we see Central Oregon today. Um, there are dozens and dozens more. I want to encourage you to continue to learn about our past so that we can uh, have a better future. Thank you all. Okay, I, I, I'm not 100% certain if I'm uh, if I if people can see me or not. Um, but Kip, I want to thank you so much for uh, the quick historical overview that you just gave. I'd um, really encourage everyone to that, that's listening today to learn more about um, Oregon's history by taking some time to watch the video that that, that Kip put together. It is um, absolutely mind blowing uh, the things that we. Uh, take for granted and, and, and some of the assumptions I've made. Um, his video, Premeditated Uniformity, uh, it will be in a link uh, in our reflections email coming out after this forum. Um, now at the beginning of this presentation, we set up a Mentimeter poll just asking uh, what people felt in terms of how welcoming Oregon is. Um, Scott, can we take a look at that response real quick? Great, I'll be interested to see um, how how those views change as we kind of go through this uh, go through this process. Um, now I'd like to kind of engage in a panel discussion. Um, Kip's presentation serves as a good reminder to me that um, yesterday's laws um, are our shared history today, and that means that today's policies uh, will be our legacy tomorrow. And so we, as a community and a society, we get to choose if we if we pass on a curse or a blessing to those future generations that we'll never know. Uh, that's why I'm so encouraged to introduce our panels of speakers today. Our panelists are actively working to change systems and attitudes in our community. First, I'd like to introduce uh, Jenna Goodman Campbell. She's with the city of Bend and she is mayor pro tem. Jenna, thanks for joining us today. Thank you, JC. And um, thanks to everyone at City Club for putting this panel together. Um, I think it's a great start and I'm really excited um, to see what comes of it and hope that we can see more discussions around these themes of racial justice um, and specific to Bend. Um, I too, like, uh, like Kip, grew up in Oregon um, and went through Portland Public Schools system. And while there was some mention of the racist past of Portland, 
I never had any idea about the exclusion laws in Oregon until I, um, until I started doing that work for myself. And so um, I also wanna note that this, this work, even though all of us will be talking about the work that we're doing within the organizations that we work for um, or within government, um, this is also really personal work. And so I wanna encourage everybody who's watching today um, who, or who might watch this later to, um, to really think about what you personally wanna work on and, um, and look for resources online at the library. There's just such a wealth of information out there um, for how you can and can work on your own personal biases, um, places where you may need to, to kind of look at how you think about the world and how you view race. So I um, just wanted to start with that encouragement as well. So um, I've been on Ben City Council since um, 2019. I was elected in, in November of 2018 and was sworn in January 2nd, 2019. Um, so uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the, the um, that council, the, the previous council that we just um, transitioned out of, um, when, when Sally Russell was elected as mayor, we um, went through appointment process because there were still two years left in her term. And so um, one of the first tasks for council was to appoint someone to fill, um, to fill Sally's seat. So that was a, um, it was a really rigorous process. We had a lot of applicants and I was personally really excited to see that um, we had a, a lot of, of really diverse applicants. We had several people of color who applied and that was something that, um, you know, that I realized uh, probably quite belatedly <laughs> on my part, given that I had lived in Bend for over a dozen years, that Bend had never had a person of color on city council. Um, and so I immediately dove into those applications and, um, and was a huge advocate for Karani Mitchell. Um, and uh, fast forward, Karani was not selected. There was a lot of discussion at the time around um, the selection of Chris Piper, a white man, over Karani. Um, and what I thought some of that missed was not so much that, um, you know, it, it, to me it was less important to, to the process that um, it wasn't so relevant that a white man was selected over a woman of color, but that I felt when what I saw from the inside of that process was that, um, that Karani as a woman of color was held to such a different standard. And so that really, um, to me, you know, I think should not have been a surprise. And to some extent it wasn't, but I don't think Karani would mind me sharing that, you know, in, in our reflections afterward when we talked about it and when she ultimately wrote a piece in the bulletin about it, which you can still go and find on their website, that she, um, that she really saw that more as a, as a kind of public unveiling of something that she had known to be true her entire life. And so for me, that was really just an indication that, um, and a huge eye opener that obviously um, people of color experience bend a lot differently than I do as a white person. And, and so that got us rolling on a whole process through goal setting um, in 2019, focused on really integrating diversity, equity, inclusion into a city of bend and our operations. Um, it resulted in a goal of establishing the Human Rights and Equity Commission, which I'm very pleased to report that we are, um, we have created the commission and now we're in the process of um, interviewing and soon we'll be seating members of that commission. So uh, for those of you not familiar with the Human Rights and Equity Commission, um, the, the, uh, the purpose is to ensure that historically marginalized and underrepresented people and communities in Bend have equal access to city programs and services, representation in city decision-making, and importantly, a venue to raise concerns and complaints about discrimination. So another thing that I became aware of um, during the, the process of creating this goal around creating the commission was that in 2004, Bend passed uh, the Equal Rights Ordinance. And it's kind of surprising to me again that that happened in 2004. That was just two years before I moved here. Um, and it seems like fairly recent history, um, but that, that ordinance uh, made it illegal to discriminate against a person based on their um, race, religion, color, sex, marital status, national origin, age, disability, sexual orientation, and gender identity um, in places of employment, uh, rental, or purchase of property, and um, through public um, kind of public services. So one of the things that was brought to my attention during this process of the, um, the Human Rights and Equity Commission formation was that um, the enforcement of Ben's Equal Rights Ordinance is either you can um, file a complaint with the Bureau of Labor and Industry 
bully at the state, or you can file a personal lawsuit. And even, you know, for me coming from a place of great privilege and resource, if I were facing discrimination, um, say from an employer, I would find it fairly intimidating <laughs> and not terribly accessible to, to try to file a complaint with bully or even know where to start to file a lawsuit. Um, and so I think a really important thing that we needed to hear through this process was that there needs to be a place where people of color and others in Bend who are facing discrimination can bring their complaint and know that they will be trusted, they will be heard, and that they will be supported in finding the resources that they need to, to kind of seek justice. So to be honest, that's something we, we, we did receive a fair amount of pushback um, on as a council. And um, that I think we made our attorneys slightly uncomfortable in, in figuring out how this would work. Um, and we still will figure out how, how it's going to work. But um, I think I'm taking a lot of time here. So I wanna make sure to hand it off, um, but um, also want to encourage people to um, look at the current council's goals that we're working on. Um, we're really working on embedding equity into everything that the, the council is going to be doing for the next two years. So. I encourage you all to check that out on the city's website and um, and to follow that process. And if you wish to, um, if you have ideas to share with us, please um, give us input. This is a public process that we're going through right now to set our goals and our work plan and our budget for the next two years. So I think with that, I'll quickly pass it off to Kinsey, um, who will talk to us more about what the school district is doing. Thanks, Jenna, and um, thank you to the City Club for um, hosting this conversation and to our um, audience members for participating with us in learning together as a community. This is um, really important work, and um, I'm personally grateful that, um, that it's happening and um, really happy to um, share some of our school district efforts as part of the conversation. Um, and so I guess thinking about some of the things that our school district is, um, is doing currently to try to move the needle on this um, issue, um, really, truly what um, we're really focused on right now is trying to center um, the voices of our students and families. Um, and, you know, each and every student and family, but really in particular, uh, the voices that we have pushed uh, furthest from the center and the voices of our students of color, our multilingual students, our LGBTQ community, for example, um, and knowing and, and really working on understanding that if we can center um, those students and families voices in our priorities and in our efforts, um, we will make improvements for all students. Um, and so I think that's sort of the, um, the direction that we're trying to go. Um, as far as what those priorities and improvements are, we've been trying to think of those in two, um, two different areas, one being student outcomes and then the other being student experiences. Um, and so as far as the experiences, we know that um, our schools need to to be welcoming, inclusive um, places for all of our students in order to um, produce the outcomes that we want to see in our students and in our community. Um, we last fall, we ran a series of almost 40 listening sessions with different groups of students and family and community members and um, heard a lot of really great feedback um, for us in, in terms of areas for growth. Um, one of those uh, areas that we heard from several different student and family groups is that we really struggle to incorporate um, our students' lives into the classroom. We really struggle to um, bring relevant experiences and um, and acknowledge who our students are, either um, you know in classroom dialogue and materials, whatever the case is, um, and that our our um, staff tend to be silent on the things that matter to our students. And so um, one of the ways we're working on that is through a teacher leadership uh, cohort with a, a pretty diverse group of um, amazing teacher leaders um, who are helping us get better at 
um, how do we engage in dialogue with students um, about you know, these current events and difficult topics? And what does it actually look like and sound like in the classroom to do this work with kids? Uh, and it is providing a ton of wonderful learning for um, our teacher team, our administrative team, uh, some great opportunities to connect with our restorative justice colleagues and other community members. Um, and so that's just one area that we're focused on um, classroom improvements. Um, we're also working on getting better at um, identifying and responding to and preventing um, incidents of discrimination or bias in our schools, um, focusing on, <clears throat> excuse me, um, issues of race, ethnicity, uh, native language, national origin, just understanding um, what what microaggressions or what experiences are our students and families having in our schools? How do we um, understand and acknowledge those and, um, and repair harm in a culturally responsive way? Again, trying to center the voices and experiences of our students. And then ultimately, how do we prevent those from happening? So um, doing a lot of work with our administrative team around um, understanding what those look like and sound like and how to um, adjust our discipline practices and our communication practices with the community um, to improve in that area. Um, the other piece that we know is um, we really, really need our, um, our staff, our teachers, our um, you know, um, assistants, our principals, everybody to represent the students and families that we serve. And so we are, um, we've hired a new director of uh, recruitment and retention and um, doing a lot of professional development with our team around um, you know, diversifying our workforce, trying to develop some pathways for um, some existing staff to um, you know, shift in their roles and leadership opportunities within our organization um, and bringing in new folks as well. Uh, we have an equity coalition that has just, um, just getting started with community members, students, staff partnership. And they're really helping us inform a lot of these different um, initiatives that we're undertaking to make sure that we aren't doing this work in our very traditional um, you know, silo of, of education. Um, and then we have some really great um, different parent groups um, already formed or starting to form a Latino family advisory um, that is a group of, of parent leaders that really push us and partner with us to get better. Our uh, Chinese culture club is just starting up with um, two amazing parent leaders from our um, Chinese community here. And so um, those are just a couple of the things that we are um, trying to do to, to keep the um, voices of our students and families centered in our priorities and in our, our improvements. Um, all of those we know will then lead to improvements in outcomes and achievement of students. Uh, we're also working, uh, Juan Cuadros, our executive director of teaching and learning, is leading some curriculum adoption processes that we're um, hoping to you know, diversify the materials that we use for teaching and learning, um, and working on some teacher trainings for supporting our multilingual community um, better, and um, just some, some trainings for all of us to get better together. So, um, those are just a, a few of the things that we are working on, um, and I'm going to pass it off to my uh, colleague and friend Marcus to share about uh, what happens after the K-12 pipeline. All right, thank you. Um, Kenzie, I appreciate it. Thank you, Jenna, as well, and JC and everyone for being here. Thank you again for City Club for allowing us to have this uh, forum. I think it's, it's a great start to be able to engage when it comes to my race. But the thing I wanna say is I wanna say happy um, uh, Black History Month to everyone and hoping everyone is taking the time to get out and learn different things that they didn't know uh, the one thing that, that always um, I always encourage people to do during this time, it's not just Black history, it's American history, and we're part of it. And I think a lot of the things that we've been uh, told and taught are, are wrong. I think I was talking to Jenna about this uh, earlier this week, or earlier today, actually, is that people don't realize that the people who get credit for things are the people who get, to, is, is amplified by the messaging. Let's talk about the things that we didn't know who helped support and actually created a lot of the things. And if you know, there's so many different things that African American and people of color have contributed to this country. And like a lot of people have said, you know, this country was built on the backs of black and brown. So that's the thing we always try to look at and we did it for free. So if you want to look at it from that standpoint, um, some of the things we're working at a COCC, just to give you guys understanding, this is the 13th season, a season of nonviolence. 
I want to applaud uh, Christy uh, Walker, who is our Diversity and Inclusion uh, Director at COCC, for coordinating a lot of the things that we're doing, along with her staff and the many people at the, uh, at the college are working on. Uh, some of the things we're doing, if you go to our website, you will see that there is a list of different speakers that you can go engage with, and the students have led some of these conversations as well. Other things that we're doing, if we have different clubs on our campus as well, including, you know, Afrocentric Club, the Latinx Club, uh, Native American Club, there's so many different uh, options for students to be to be engaged in so they can learn more not only about the heritage, but just learn more how they can engage and work with one another. I think this Friday, we also are having a teaching academy to be able to have how we have conversations about race. I think that's going to be beneficial to help the teachers know how to combat when a student talks about race or there's a discriminatory uh, uh, issue that happens in class. So there, like I said, there's so many different things that we're doing. Other things that I am working on, uh, there's a community organization called the Fathers Group. What we're looking to do is to work with uh, not only families, but work with the school district and the city to try to be uh, culturally engaging. Uh, we're in the process right now, actually, of putting out a survey, which is going to be out on Monday the 22nd, to basically engage in families and see what type of services that we can provide to our community. It's going to be in Spanish, and we're trying to get the translation hopefully done by tomorrow so we can have it out to our family. So if you need to get that survey, we'll definitely have that information for you here at the end. Also, what we're doing is we're in the process of creating the after school program that allows us to be able to engage with those same students. We're looking to do a summer program and then I'll do our full rollout that's going to be this fall. So like I said, there's many things that you can engage in, not only at the college, but in the community. You just have to take the time to reach out to the various community organizations to make this happen. Uh, and then also the Restorative Justice and Equity commission, uh, commission is basically working to create a community cadre to work with the school district as well, like Kenzie mentioned, that they can help and engage in how to combat some of the various things that happen in our school system. But the one thing I want to encourage everyone who's listening today is this. And I may not be able to get to say this later, but I want to say it now. I want you to dare to want to um, engage yourself in the community. I want to dare you to step outside your comfort zone, your silo to do that. But the thing you got to do is be able to be willing to be able to create different norms that change the environment that you engage. But the thing we got to look at, and Stacey Abrams said it the best, your ambitions can be what they are, but you have to have a plan. And you got to execute it because if you don't, it's still just a dream. So what I challenge everyone to do in this community is to educate themselves and put yourself in a place to create policy and change that's going to be equitable for our whole society. And that's the thing I would love to see, not only from a higher learning standpoint, but just this community at large. Uh, demographically, I think uh, Dr. Ken, uh, Dr. Kendi or Ember Kendi said it best. He goes, when you start looking at policies and you want to start making change, if you don't talk about race in a way we can receive data on looking at the policies and procedures that are necessary for change, then guess what? We'll never know. So then everything will stay where it's currently at. Let's look out, look beyond uh, just working on talking about it. Let's actually take the steps to do something about it. All right. So JC, it's back to you. Thanks, Marcus. I appreciate that. Yeah, I think it's actually really critical. I, one of the things that I'm, I'm, I'm picking up um, just in our conversation here is um, all the initiatives that we seem to be currently engaging in. And that's um, a really um, encouraging uh, thing. I, you know, there are a lot of things that are sparking up in the community just within the last year that I'm hearing um, spoken to about all throughout the panel. What I'd love to hear is... Um, you know, have we, what, what are some past successes that we've been able to score as, as a victory? Things that have actually already gotten some traction um, in, in what we're doing uh, to make the community more aware um, and more inclusive. Um, does, can anybody speak to that? I guess I'll just start by saying, you know, I think that um, Really, I just want to give credit to kind of the grassroots activists who have made a lot of these change hap changes happen. Um, you know, the the city has, I think, had some successes. They be later or slower than a lot of people would like to see, and that's the the way of the world. <laughs> but um, but you know, I, I I just want to give credit to kind of the the activist community that has really pushed um, and pushed hard to get us to where we are now. Um, I think that in itself is a success that we are are starting to listen to people and that we're listening to the people who 
who are really, you know, the most directly impacted by racism and discrimination and, um, and that we're listening. Absolutely. And maybe another way to frame, frame that question would be, you know, what have the challenges been in kind of getting us to the point where we're at right now? Like what, what have we, what's, what's been the obstacles that you guys have seen as you've been laboring in the fields? For me, I think some of the challenges have been, if you can hear me okay, um, some of the challenges have been making sure that the people in power positions are engaged and understand the direction we're trying to go and, and making sure that they have a clear picture of what the plan is. And then it's almost like you had to convince them. But I think after George Floyd murder and a lot of people I thought started to engage a little bit more and they started recognizing, I think in the beginning of the protests, I think what happened is that people were doing it out of guilt and it's just, that's just my honest assessment. And I think, people felt a little scared. And now they're realizing, okay, for us to have equitable change, we have to be inclusive. And the challenges were, okay, do you recognize that you do have to engage? A uh, gentleman spoke to me and he goes, well, I, I was talking to a gentleman, he, he's Caucasian, he goes, who goes, what, what, what does the, the uh, BIPOC community want from us? He goes, we want you to govern and lead. We want you to dig deep and find a way to help. And instead of sitting back and just letting, thinking it's just going to go away or just, you know, it's just not going to continue, engage and, and find a way to, you know, look inside yourself to make that change. And the challenge was that, just trying to convince people that, yeah, it's a necessary change. But I think now over time, people are starting to recognize, oh, my God, for this to really be truly something we want to happen in our community and be inclusive, we're going to have to do this collaboratively. But you can't rely upon the backs of the BIPOC community to make that happen. You've got to have to find a way to do it yourself. And, it, and it's going to hurt. It's going to hurt. <laughs> it is going to hurt. But, and it's going to make you uncomfortable. But once you realize you're engaged, all of a sudden you're going to realize, oh, my God, it's fruitful. I would totally um, agree, Marcus, just as far as that um, partnership and needing to, um, you know, find ways to do the work together. Um, we have lots of bright spots in our district and amazing teachers doing amazing work. And um, our, you know, team of Latino family liaisons are um, wonderful and, and lots of different specialists and administrators working really hard, but how to um, systematize that and make that the, uh, you know, the norm and not the exception and uh, make sure that it's a community approach um, you know, teachers with the community and our white teachers with our teachers of color doing that together. So it doesn't feel like Marcus said on, um, you know, that it's on the backs of a particular group. Um, and just as a, as a, you know, white person myself, um, working on finding that balance between, um, understanding that um, I need to lead this work. This work came from my white community, um, you know, created a lot of the, the situation that we're in, um, but not centering my feelings and my, um, you know, process in, um, in, you know, the content of how we go about that work as an ongoing uh, challenge for me personally, and, and I think for some colleagues as well. Um, I think keeping the energy up, like Marcus said, um, you know, after last spring, there's a lot of interest and um, lots of guilt and feelings that brought people to the table, but how to keep people at the table um, when it, it goes from being, uh, you know, sure there was a, a resurgence, but I think um, for a lot of us white people, that was just a, um, an awareness that finally raised up to a certain level where, um, you know, this has been going on and there's been a lot of work for a long time. And so, um, for us folks who are newer to the table, how do we, um, stay there and, and keep pushing it forward? Um, and then one of the things that we've been, we've been learning is, um, and, and I've been, um, learning personally too, is, um, in our country, there is a history of distrust of educators to engage in this work. Um, after you know each of our major wars as a country, there are definite patterns where we um, 
we deny teachers the opportunity to talk about controversial issues for a while. Um, teachers were fired for talking about communism or socialism. Um, and so we have a culture in our country of um, not wanting uh, to allow teachers to engage in this and teachers who do are doing it um, in spite of and not because of the system. And so that's definitely something that we are you know, acknowledging and trying to work through so that we can um, change that culture. There's so much I could um, <laughs> tee off of what both you both said. Um, one thing that, that comes to mind for me um, in terms of the, the challenges is that, um, I, in, in preparing for this discussion, I was talking with Bruce Abernethy, who was on council with me over the last couple of years, but also on council in 2004 when the Equal Rights Ordinance was passed. And I asked him what some of the pushback that they got at the time was. And he said, you know, it was a lot of people saying things like, well, you're being overly politically correct. This isn't really necessary. This isn't really an issue. Um, and it, what was really fascinating to me is those, those are the same kinds of arguments we're getting against this work today. And so, you know, I think that the, the conversation continues, but, you know, as Marcus said, like, this is going to take us, a lot of us out of our comfort zone. Um, but that's, that's a good thing. I mean, you know, it's, it just shows that we're human, that we're, um, that you experience feelings of discomfort because this is, you know, like, like we've, like we've gone over, this is really, you know, these are terrible things that have been, um, you know, perpetrated in our past and are continuing to occur, um, terrible injustices. And of course it, it makes us human that, that we feel feelings about it, but, um, but it doesn't mean that we're physically unsafe. You know, that's just because we're uncomfortable, it doesn't mean that um, that we're in any sort of danger. And this is really, um, really great, you know, for, for the community to be on this journey. I really like um, how Marcus, how you spoke to the idea of um, taking this on and, and making it granular, right? Making it personable, making it um, something that everyone has a stake in. Um, and one of the ways I always help that always helps me process information is is hearing stories or anecdotes that like kind of exemplify uh, what you're talking about. I, I'd love to hear if, if anybody has like a good example where where somebody that's listening to the website to the webcast may have um, an inkling of what they could do, but um, maybe a story that you guys could share might actually be the spark that ignites um, them to take the next step. Does anybody have um, any any good stories out there? And Kip, I would throw that to you too, because I know the faith community is really involved in, in, in this work as well. I can uh, just to um, try to practice what we're talking about in the school district. I think some of the best stories about this work are coming from our students and our families. And so I would really encourage any um, participants today to um, dig into our report from our listening sessions last year. Um, we can, we'll share the link in the follow-up um, documents. And so I think to me, those are the most impactful stories are the ones that our students and families have told us. Um, so just a little plug to check those out. This is one of my stories is speaking of Bruce Abernathy and some of the, um, Caucasian members of the Fathers group, because everybody thinks we're Af totally African-American and we're not. Um, the way they came to us and, and Mr. Mike Latore is, is as well, and Nate Montgomery also, they, they're white gentlemen who have come to us and said, we want to find a way to learn of how you want to engage. They took the time to come and engage. And also uh, Clint Burley as well from the police department, they, they all took the time to come because they, they saw that, hey, you know, wait a minute, if, if we really want change to happen, let's go and see what they're doing. And when they did, they realized, oh my God, we can make actual change happen. You know, we can give our expertise what we have. They're not trying to say they know it all. They just want to engage and they can see, and I can see their genuineness when we talk. And we have great conversations and we learn more about their families and we realize we're all human and we're just trying to make things happen. And if I, if I put their names out there, I'm sorry, I didn't want to do it, but I, I'm sorry I have to put them on the spot, but it's, it's, it's what they chose to do as human beings, not as just white men, it's just as human beings. And I really appreciate that they've made that effort to do that. 
So those are some of the success stories that I see because then they can be advocates and they can make other people feel comfortable want to be a part of what some people are trying to do in the community. And, and that's a great success in my mind. Good deal. Well, we're actually starting to get some questions coming in from um, the people who are on this thread. Um, I, I've got a question that I, um, I think, Kenzie, I'll throw to you. Um, the question here is, is there a move to make this information a mandatory part of our curriculum in the school system, as well as some kind of programming to encourage accepting all people, is the question from the audience. Um, yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, so we are, um, I would say, there's a yes and a no part. Um, I mentioned earlier that um, our teaching and learning department is engaging in our, our next cycles of curriculum adoption, where we go through different materials and a, a really extensive review process to select the materials that we use for teaching and learning in classrooms. And um, I know that that process um, led by Juan, our executive director, will have a, a large focus on um, you know, diversifying our materials, making sure that, um, that issues of, of inclusion and diversity are, are represented in materials uh, and that our students uh, themselves are, are represented and can connect with the materials that we use. And those um, curriculum adoption processes lead to the required materials materials for teachers to use in classrooms. So um, I would say that's the, the, the yes piece. Um, and then as far as, um, you know, the I mentioned earlier, the teacher leadership group who is working on um, strategies and um, tips for like how to engage in dialogue with, um, you know, students in the classroom about this work right now. Um, Currently, that work is not required. We're not saying all teachers need to go out and um, implement this strategy by you know, March. Um, and that's because we know that leadership is, um, you know, true leadership starts with uh, modeling and leading by example. And so this group of um, amazing teacher leaders is um, developing these strategies and tips for their colleagues and for themselves. And they're starting with trying them out, um, you know, piloting, practicing, um, reflecting on them, refining them. Our next step is going to be reaching out to some community partners uh, to get some feedback on them. And um, so at, at this point, those types of uh, resources and supports are not required, um, but obviously strongly encouraged. And we're setting up uh, support systems, some peer coaching and other opportunities for teachers who um, are interested, you know, at any level, whether it's just to watch a teacher try some of these or to um, teach one of them together um, or to just take them and try them out in their own classrooms. So um, we're, we're trying to um, make it um, a process with multiple entry points for all of our teachers. Great. Um... Thanks, Kinsey. The um, uh, next question we've got here um, I actually kind of backpacks or <laughs> backpacks onto the, the question before. Um, and Kinsey, I, I, I guess I'm picking on you, but the, the question here is, um, and I, I can throw this out to everyone, but um, how can we raise awareness about the systemic flaws in our educational system? I mean, I think we're, we're taking practices to address them now, but I, I think we'd be blind to say that they don't, that there aren't some things that actually exist. What what can how, what can we do to raise awareness? Yeah, I'll um, I will take a shot at that one, and then I'd love to hear from Jenna and Marcus too. Um, sometimes it's you know not being in the K twelve public system is easier to um, uh, help us identify where we can get better. Um, one of the things that I personally think would help a lot is um, I feel like our community needs to um, stop saying, and I'm trying to stop saying, Bend has no diversity. Um, I feel like that phrase erases the, the existence of a, a strong and passionate uh, community that we do have here um, and lots of different identities that live in this uh, community. And I know that's not to say that, um, you know, we have the same um, size of groups as other, you know, larger cities. But um, I think practicing language that doesn't erase um, 
you know, wonderful neighbors and community members that do live here and are doing really amazing work is important for all of us. Um, and I think that um, one of the challenges that our system continues to experience, and I think always will, um, it's part of a, a healthy democracy, is um, pushback from parents or community members when we uh, do implement some of these um, initiatives in our classrooms. We um, you know, we hear from our community all the time. And like I said, we, we should, that's an important part of the process. Um, but to have that be respectful, healthy dialogue and, um, you know, always with the utmost respect for the teachers that do this work, um, I think is something that we really need our community to support us with and, and not uh, taking out our continued learning and misunderstandings as a community on our teachers is really important um, that we are here to engage in dialogue. We want to do that. And, um, and it's, um, you know, we want to do that together um, productively. Um, and so, you know, we have already even ahead of our formal adoption uh, process for new curriculum, we have some wonderful things happening. Uh, Michelle Clements is a teacher leader of ours who has done um, amazing work with teams of teachers diversifying the, the novels and materials that are being read at um, you know, the high school level, moving that work into the middle school level. Um, and that the work is truly amazing, but we also know that it, um, you know, if you don't know that much about it, you it might make some people uncomfortable. And we really want to have open doors and encourage that dialogue uh, to really understand what we're doing. So I think that's a big ask that we have of our community is, is um, come talk to us and um, and know that our, our teachers are doing really amazing work and we'd love to share and learn and keep getting better together. And to piggyback some of what she said too, I think the thing we got to look at is in terms of you know prioritizing the development of support for those teachers. You got to have support for them, and they got to have the opportunity to be able to train and learn themselves. But also, we got to make sure we have effective policies that's going to be able to allow them to do so. And we got to evaluate what we have. But on top of that, I think we got to also hold the administration accountable for some of these things too, because the teachers only can do so much by what they're giving and the support that they're giving. So we got to make sure that, the, you know, the principals in those various schools and the administration working in those, and I know they're busy right now coming out of this pandemic, but at the same time, when we get to a point where we can level off a little bit, I think we definitely need to make sure that we have a means to be able to get everyone together and figure out how we can make these things happen. Because we already know the issues we're having right now come, currently coming back from the pandemic, but as this goes and we start getting back to full school, uh, those teachers are going to need the support necessary for them to be successful because I can only imagine what they're going through right now. Just quickly to add on, I, I, you know, not to just pick on the education system. I mean, let's be honest, all systems, um, you know, I think that if you look at any, any system in this country that was, that was constructed, um, you know, at the same time that all of these racist events were occurring, you have to think there are there are racist roots in most, if not all of the systems that we operate within today. And so I think a big part of that that I've tried to take on is just to talk about them. That's, I think, a big part of raising awareness, especially for me with the voice and the platform, the privilege that I have of sitting on council to use my voice to just talk clearly and honestly about what we see. Um, it's kind of that if you see something, say something. Um, it can feel uncomfortable and scary, but it's just actually not. Um, <laughs> especially when you see others listening and nodding and, and, you know, increasing their understanding. Thank you, Jenna. That's a, um, something that we're working on too. Um, and to Marcus's point about, um, our administrative team really needing, um, support as well in this work. We, um, have some consultants helping us and are continuing to engage with our admin team in, in learning alongside our teachers in how this work looks and sounds and how to support um, you know, being courageous and vulnerable in our leadership as, uh, of this work. And so that's definitely um, an, an ongoing effort as well, but learning to just um, you know, engage in the dialogue and show up as learners, um, but also to um, show up as, as leaders, not uh, trying to make that shift from allies to co-conspirators is something that we're working on as a system.
Great. Well, I think we've got um, time for maybe one more question and then we'll, we'll wrap it up. Um, you know, I, I think the best one I've heard here is um, we had heard about some, um, you know, pushback. And I, I think a lot of times um, people see this, this struggle as a zero sum game. I know we've talked about that before. Um, and framing this idea in, in the idea that uh, in order for one uh, people to advance, um, the other, you know, you're taking ground from other from others. What, what's the best way to address that that concern? For me, do your research. It takes time to do your work. Do the research. Prime example. I'm gonna give you some quick statistics. It was a, it was a New York Times piece. Millionaire, millionaire sons of black millionaire sons are more inclined to be able to be incarcerated than working class white men. Think about that for a second. That's data for you. Or that college educated black women are more inclined to die during birth than high school dropout women. Think about those, those, those dynamics for a, for a second, right? Also think about it more People, high school dropouts, white high school dropouts have more wealth than black college dropouts. So do your research, know the data, know how we got to this point, right? Do the work. Kip did a great job. He did his work. Do the work. Look up the information because, you know, if you don't, you're going to continue to get the same return every single time. Do the work because it's only going to make things better. And statistically, in that same New York Times piece, they talked about it. And I talked about it in the beginning. Companies do better when they're more inclusive and people have the ability to be engaging. It's not that hard in my mind, but you've got to do the work and you've got to go beyond yourself to make that happen. So that's just where I'm coming from in terms of making sure that this is equitable for everyone. Because don't get me wrong, I want everyone to have the ability to be able to have a fruitful life. You notice I didn't say bless black and brown. I want everyone to have a fruitful life. But at the same time too, I don't want anyone to be excluded in that. And I want everyone to be engaged in this, have the opportunity to be, and why you got this, when you were born, that space in the middle till you're gone is to be, have an opportunity to be the best you can be during that time frame. That's the way I see it. Those are excellent thoughts. And I think we're gonna to have to leave it there. Um, thank you guys, thank you everyone for participating um, and, and, and kind of feel, starting this conversation. I really hope it's a start of a conversation that will lead to some introspection, some self-awareness. Um, I'm looking forward to, to see what comes of it. To that extent, we have um, two more uh, many meter questions, I believe here. Um, I'm trusting in the uh, technology because I can't see it behind the screen. But uh, the first one is, has this forum helped you change your thoughts whether or not Central uh, Oregon is welcoming or not. And the second one is, are you interested in further conversation about this topic? And I know we would love to get uh, the responses from the community, from the people that are, that are watching to see, to see if this has, has moved the needle. Um, with that, um, I'm gonna thank everyone. Uh, I'm gonna thank today's speakers for taking the time out of their busy schedules to participate in today's program. Uh, thanks also to uh, Linda Orsoletto, Cat uh, Mass, Mastra, oh man, Kat Mastrangelo, um, sorry Kat, um, and the other program committee members uh, who helped make this program ha happen. Um, we, will, we encourage you guys to continue this conversation with your friends, coworkers, family, and neighbors. Um, also look for the reflection piece on our website that involves additional resources uh, on how you can get involved. Um, remember that if you enjoyed today's forum and would like to help support City Club, please consider becoming a member or a live stream sponsor at cityclubco.org. Um, although it's been a while since City Club held a forum on the topic of wildfire, we all know that the thought is never far from our minds. Uh, some of the worst wildfires in history occurred last year all along the U.S. West Coast, causing losses of homes, lives, flora, and fauna. Our March forum will focus the discussion on potential adoption of county and city codes to require fire mitigation me measures in our building and landscaping practices. The county is currently considering this very question. So cities within our county may be limited by the county's choice. Stricter codes have the possibility of increasing home costs in an area that's already struggling with affordable housing. At the same time, 
And there's been little discussion about the longer term costs of not adopting fire mitigation measures, such as increased insurance costs, loss of structures to wildfire, economic loss or worse, loss of life. So we invite you to join our conversation about this and more next month. Our March forum is noon on the 18th. Uh, uh, yeah, March is noon 18th. So thank you for watching. Please continue to cultivate conversation about issues that connect us all to build a stronger community. Thank you.